Thank you very much, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Lovely to see you all here tonight. We are having a very entertaining night, are we not? With some very interesting things being said uh, from the other side of the house tonight. Um, let me begin by saying, as a Muslim, as a representative of Islam, I would consider myself an ambassador for Islam, a believer in Islam, a follower of Islam and its prophet. So in that capacity, let me begin by apologizing to Anne-Marie for the Bali bombings. I apologize for the role of my religion and me and my people, uh, for the killing of Theo van Gogh, for 7-7. Seven, seven. Yes, that was all of us. That was Islam, that was Muslims, that was the Quran. I mean, astonishing, astonishing claims uh, to make in the very first speech tonight, on a day like today, where the Conservative Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is having to come out and point out that these kind of views are anathema. And I believe you're trying to stand for the Labour Party to become an MP in Brighton. If you do uh, and you make these comments, I'm guessing you'll have the whip withdrawn from you. But then again, UKIP's on the rise. They'll take you, the BNP. They might have uh, something to say about your views. What Nadi Hassan always does. By the way, 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 just on a factual point, since we heard a lot about the second speaker, about how backward we Muslims all are. On a factual point, you said that Islam was born in Saudi Arabia. Islam was born in 610 AD. Saudi Arabia was born in 1932 AD. So you were only 1,322 years off. Not bad? Not bad start there. Uh, talking of maths, by the way. A man named Al Qawarizmi was one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, a Muslim. Worked in the golden age of Islam. He's the guy who came up with not just algebra, but algorithms. Without algorithms, you wouldn't have laptops. Without laptops, Daniel Johnson tonight wouldn't have been able to print out his speech in which he came to berate us Muslims for holding back the advance and intellectual achievements of the West, which all happened without any contribution from anyone else other than the Judeo-Christian people of Europe. In fact, Daniel David Levering, the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning historian and author of The Golden Crucible, points out that there would be no Renaissance, there would be no Reformation in Europe without the role played by Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd and some of the great Muslim theologians, philosophers, scientists in bringing Greek text to Europe. As for this being our university, I will leave that to the imagination as to who is our and who is there. Uh, I studied here too. Um, an astonishing, astonishing set of uh, speeches so far making this case tonight. Uh, a mixture of just cherry-picked quotes, facts and figures, self-serving, selective, a farrago of distortions, misrepresentations, misinterpretations, misquotations. Uh, Daniel talked about my article in the New Statesman, which got me a lot of flack, where I talked about the anti-Semitism that is prevalent in some parts of the Muslim community, which indeed it is. Uh, of course, I didn't say in that piece that it was caused by the religion of Islam. In fact, uh, modern anti-Semitism in the Middle East was imported from, finish the sentence, Christian, Judeo-Christian Europe, where I believe some certain bad things happened to the Jewish people. In fact, Tom Friedman, Jewish-American columnist in the New York Times, told me in this very chamber last week that he believed, had Muslims been running Europe in the 1940s, six million extra Jews would still be alive today. So I'm not going to take lessons in anti-Semitism from someone who's here to defend the Judeo-Christian values of a continent that murdered six million Jews. Uh, moving swiftly on. Moving swiftly on. Yes. Absolutely. Well, I'm about to make that point. No, 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 I'm about to make that point. You're right. I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you 110%. That is my point. I don't think Europe is evil or bad. I'm a very proud European. I don't want to judge Europe on the basis. But if we're going to play this gutter game where we pull out the Bali bombing and we pull out examples of anti-Semitism in the Islamic community, then of course I'm going to come back and say, well, hold on. I mean, look, let's be very clear. Daniel here was a last minute replacement for Douglas Murray who had to pull out. And Douglas and I have a well-documented differences. But to be fair to Douglas, as to be fair to Anne-Marie and to Peter, atheists. Atheists see all religions as evil, violent, threatening. What the problem I have with Daniel's speech is that Daniel comes here to run this robust defense of Christianity, forgetting that his fellow Christians, people who said they were acting in the name of Jesus, gave us the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, the anti-Jewish pogroms, European colonialism in Africa and Asia, the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, not to mention countless arson and bomb attacks on abortion clinics in the United States of America to this very day. I would like a little bit of humility from Daniel first before he begins lecturing other communities and other faiths on violence, terror and intolerance. But, no thank you. 
some water. I want some water. But I would say this, to address the gentleman's very valid point here, I'm not going to play that game. I don't actually believe that Christianity is a religion of violence and hate because of what the LRA does in Uganda or what, uh, what crusaders did uh, to Jews and Muslims in Jerusalem when they took back the city in the 12th or 13th or whatever century it was. I believe that Christianity, like Islam, like pretty much every mainstream religion, is based on love and compassion and faith. I do follow a religion in which 113 out of the 114 chapters of the Quran begins by introducing the God of Islam as a God of mercy and compassion. I would not have it any other way. I don't follow a religion which introduces my God to me as a God of war, as some kind of Greek God of wrath, uh, as a God of hate and injustice. Not at all. As Adam pointed out, you go through the Quran and you see the mercy and the love and the justice. And yes, you have verses that refer to warfare and violence. Of course it does. This is not a motion about pacifism. I'm not here to argue that Islam is a pacifistic faith. It is not. Islam allows military action, violence in certain limited contexts. And yes, a minority of Muslims do take it out of that context. But is it religious? We talked about Woolwich. Daniel and Anne-Marie have suggested that it's definitely religion that's behind all of this. Well, actually, what I find so amusing tonight is we're having a debate about Islam and the opposition tonight have come forward. We have a graduate in law, a graduate in modern history, a graduate in chemistry. Uh, and, you know, I admire all of their intellects and their abilities, but we don't have anyone who's actually a, an expert on Islam, a scholar of Islam, a historian of Islam, a speaker of Arabic, even a terrorism expert or a security expert or a pollster, let alone to talk about what Muslims believe or think. Instead, we have people coming here, putting forward these views, putting forward these sweeping opinions. Listen to Professor Robert Pape of the University of Chicago, one of America's leading terrorism experts who, unlike our esteemed opposition tonight, studied every single case of suicide terrorism between 1980 and 2005, 315 cases in total. And he concluded, and I quote, there is little connection between suicide terrorism and Islamic fundamentalism or any of the world's religions. Rather, what nearly all suicide terrorist attacks have in common is a specific secular and strategic goal to compel modern democracies to withdraw military forces from territory that the terrorists consider to be their homeland. And the irony is, when we talk about terrorism, the irony is that the opposition and the Muslim terrorists, the Al-Qaeda types, actually have one thing in common. Because they both believe that Islam is a warlike, violent religion. They both agree on that. They have everything in common. Osama bin Laden would be nodding along to everything he's heard tonight from the opposition. He agrees with them. The problem is... The problem is that mainstream Muslims don't. The majority of Muslims around the world don't. In fact, a gentleman here started quoting all sorts of polls. Gallup carried out the biggest poll of Muslims around the world of 35,000, 50,000 Muslims in 35 countries. 93% of Muslims rejected 9-11 and suicide attacks. And of the 7% who didn't, they all, when polled and focus grouped, cited political reasons for their support for violence, not religious reasons. And as for Islamic scholars and what they say, well, Daniel talks about our University of Oxford. We'll go down to Oxford's Centre for Islamic Studies, get hold of a man named Sheikh Afifi Al-Akiti, who is a massively well-credentialed and well-respected Islamic scholar who has studied across the world, who in the days after 7-7 published a fatwa denouncing terrorism in the name of Islam, calling for the protection of all non-combatants at all times and describing suicide bombings as an innovation with no basis in Islamic law. Go and listen to Sheikh Tahir al-Qadri, one of Pakistan's most famous Islamic scholars, who published a 600-page fatwa condemning the killing of all innocents and all suicide bombings unconditionally without any ifs or buts. There's nothing new here. This is mainstream Islam, mainstream scholarship, which has said this for years. You don't go out and kill people willy-nilly in the high street or anywhere else on a bus or a mall based on verses of the Quran that you cherry-pick without any context, any understanding, any interpretation or any commentary. Point of information. Please. Well, it's, it's, it doesn't happen apparently. I didn't say it doesn't happen at all. I never said it didn't happen. I don't blame Islam. Yes, it's a very good point. And a lot of us, a lot of us, are campaigning against that. And we're campaigning against it in the name of Islam. We're campaigning against it in the name of various interpretations of Islam. Anne-Marie comes and scares us with her talk of Sharia law. I would like to see the book of Sharia law. It doesn't exist. People argue over what Sharia law is. And you empower the extremists by saying there is only one version. You empower them all. I don't believe you Several took any interruptions, Anne-Marie, so I think you should stay there for a moment. Several countries. Here's, here's what we're dealing with. Here's what we're dealing with. 
We are dealing, I took your point, I took your point. Here we are dealing with a 1400 year old global religion followed by 1.6 billion people in every corner of the world, a quarter of humanity, of all backgrounds, cultures, ethnicities. And yet the opposition tonight wants to generalize, stereotype, smear in order to desperately win this debate. And here's my question, if we're going to generalize and smear. If, okay, people say yesterday's bombers and we've got to be careful, there's a trial going on. Were yesterday's attackers, sorry, motivated by Islam? Big debate. I don't believe they were. Let's say they were. Let's say Faisal Shahzad, the Times Square bomber, was motivated by Islam. Let's assume, for sake of argument, uh, that Richard Reeves, the shoe bomber, was motivated by Islam. If Islam is responsible for these killings, if Islam is what is motivating these people, and Islam is therefore not a religion of peace or religion of war, then ask yourself this question, why aren't the rest of us doing it? Why is it such a tiny minority of Muslims are interpreting their religion in the way that the opposition claim they are? Let's assume there are 16,000 suicide bombers in the world. There aren't. Let's assume there are for the sake of argument. That's 0.001% of the Muslim population globally. What about the other 99.99% of Muslims who the opposition tonight either ignore or smear? The reality is that the rest of us aren't blowing ourselves up tonight. The reality is that the opposition came here tonight not worried about the fact that me and Adam might po pull open our jackets and blow ourselves up tonight because we're followers of a warlike warrior religion which wants to take over Europe and Daniel's university. The issue is this. The issue is this. Unless the opposition can tell us tonight, and Peter Atkins is here, one of our great atheist intellectuals, can tell us tonight, can they can answer this question tonight, why don't the vast majority of Muslims around the world behave as violently and aggressively as a tiny minority of politically motivated extremists, then they might as well give up and stop pretending they have anything relevant to say about Islam or Muslims as a whole. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this to you. Think about what the opposite of this motion is. If you vote no tonight, think about what you're saying the opposite motion is. That Islam isn't a religion of peace, it's a religion of war, of violence, of terror, of aggression. That the people who follow Islam, me, my wife, my retired parents, my six-year-old child, that 1.8 million of your fellow British residents and citizens, that 1.6 billion people across the world, your fellow human beings, are all followers, promoters, believers in a religion of violence. Do you really think that? Do you really believe that to be the case? They say that in the Oxford Union, the most famous debate was in 1933, when Adolf Hitler looked out for the result of the king and country motion, where they voted against fighting for king and country, and Hitler was listening out for the result. Well, tonight, 80 years on, there are two groups of people around the world who I would argue are waiting for the result of tonight's vote. There are the millions of peaceful, non-violent, law-abiding Muslims, both in the UK, Europe, Asia, Africa, and beyond, who see Islam as the source of their identity, as a source of spiritual fulfillment, of hope, of solace. And there are the phobes, the haters, the bigots out there who want to push the clash of civilizations, who want to divide all of us into them and us and ours and their. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge you all not to fuel the arguments of the phobes and bigots. Don't legitimize their divisions. Don't legitimize their hate. Trust those Muslims who you know, who you've met, who you hear, who don't believe in violence, who do want you to hear the peaceful message of the Qur'an as they believe it to be taught to the majority of Muslims, the Islam of peace and compassion and mercy, the Islam of the Qur'an, not of Al-Qaeda. Ladies and gentlemen, I beg to propose this motion to the House. I urge you to vote yes tonight. Thank you very much for your time. So I, I just think it's very unfair that why has Islam been singled out as this horrendous, bad, violent religion just because of what a tiny percentage of extremists have done claiming it's in the name of Islam. Why don't we do that? Why don't we look at other religions and treat it the same and use what a minority of extremists have done to dictate how we feel about the entire religion? I'm personally not a follower of islam but i still can look at actually the facts and the people that i know that follow islam that are kind lovely caring helpful people that don't agree with what these extremists have done and are very open and say that that isn't islam you can say something's in the name of it but that doesn't actually embody what the religion is about and i think what was really interesting in that video is how he was saying the people that are arguing against him have they actually gone and studied islam have they studied the quran in its depth like i can hold my personal opinions but how can i you know start arguing against something if i haven't looked into it properly and i think that was really interesting i think actually the way he put his point across 
was so powerful that you can't argue against it he's the facts the numbers that he you know he puts in there he he is a follower of islam he knows what the quran says he knows the ins and outs of it all and yet there are people out there who've probably never picked it picked the book up never probably never even done a google search on the religion and go oh well this is what the media says this is what society says so we'll follow that we'll create a divide we'll create you know a, I just, I personally don't understand why people feel that way. I think if more people saw that video and actually took the time to think and reflect, I think that, you know, the world would be a better place. I think that, you know, those principles could probably be applied to different religions, different um, ethnic minorities, different groups of people, that why do we base the majority of the good people why do we overrule them by the minority of the bad people you know i think i don't know i i feel very um overwhelmed by that actually because i think that made me personally think a lot and actually question what i've heard and what i've seen in the media is that true or is that just a popular opinion that is posted to create controversy and to get views and to get likes. Again, I thought that video was very, very educational and inspiring. As religion is not something I know lots about, but at, to bring together everyone in unity and a community and to educate yourself and all the different religions is very important. There are so many different religions out there. Everyone believes they're true to believe whatever they want to believe. And it's just about aligning everyone and bringing everyone together. And it doesn't have to be a competition who's better. And it's just all about educating yourself with all the different religions. Wow. <laughs> that was um, obviously Mahdi Hassan is very intellectually versed in uh, um, saying the argument that Islam is a peaceful religion and I really agree with that. Um, obviously, as uh, I said in the previous video, so, or saying it now, I'm not, I'm not an Islam identifier. I don't identify myself as a Muslim. I don't identify myself with any religion. I do feel like there is a higher power out there, but um, I'm more of into spirituality and having my own beliefs. But I feel that there's not a lot of media representation for the beliefs of Muslim. And I'm so glad that there's someone who spoke up, like Mahdi Hassan, uh, that Islam isn't a, a religion of war because it really isn't. Um, you could say, the, the Islams could even say that the Christianity is a religion of war with how many wars that have been started in the last hundreds and thousands of years ago because of religion, because of Christianity, but just because there's so much activity at the moment with my, what Mati Hassan said, I'm so sorry, I'm not really well versed into this type of um, argument, but I feel that each, uh, each side have their, has their own argument and it would be so unfair for people to vote <laughs> that Islam would be a religion of war because as I said, Christianity has also done its, um, has done its past, uh, has had its history in war and civil war. Um, and I just feel that you don't see a lot of videos like this going around and I'm quite glad to see this because honestly, I don't know a lot about the Islamic religion. Um, I've not done a lot of research since A-level uh, GCSE where I studied philosophy and ethics. Um, so I can't really say too much about the topic um, because I would just I would just be talking really stupid stuff. But um, this isn't stupid stuff either. <laughs> but I have not seen an argument like this at all in the way it has been set because it's not really 
openly accessible to the public and if it is i feel that the public would be more more able to accept that islam is a good religion not just peaceful it's also good it as abadi hassan said it so many people rely on it for their spirituality their uh their mental health probably and the, the, the way the way they're living you know it's it's how they see themselves as it's how they identify themselves and for people to just you know, smear it, as you said, and make it sound like a really bad religion just because of the activity that has been happening in the past, it would be really unfair because we could say the same for Christianity. We could say the same for so many other religions who have started wars in, this, in the name of their god or gods, you know? Um, and I feel like this was really, really good to watch. And I just hope that the public can, the majority of the public can also watch this and stuff like this, not just for Islam uh, and for other religions as well. So we can just accept to, that we have different beliefs and accept that it's how we go about our lives and how we find inner peace, how we find to have stable mental health and how we find to just go about the world. And yeah, um, I quite like watching this. I almost feel like I should take a breath for him because he didn't stop talking for about 13 minutes. Um, but everything that he said uh, was, was, you know, made, made a lot of sense. The only thing he did say in that, which, which I didn't agree with, is that all atheists or agnostics think that uh, all religion is evil. Uh, I'm an atheist and I certainly don't think that any religion is evil, including Islam. Um, but uh, I would like to have heard the other side of that, the opposition, what they had to say before that, because his response to that suggested that they were saying some horrible things. And if they were, they need to take a look at themselves because, you know, it didn't it didn't seem like they were being very fair for what they were saying. So I thought a, a lot of his points, you know, that ninety nine point nine nine percent of Muslims um, are peaceful. They're just like anyone else on earth, uh, from, you know, doesn't matter what your religion is or, you know, no religion, you know, majority of people on earth are peaceful and they want a normal life. They want to treat people with respect, with compassion, and that is no different from Islam. Uh, so I agreed with, uh, a lot of, you know, pretty much everything that he said, uh, across that video. And, um, it actually strikes a chord with me a little bit, and I won't go on about this too long, but um, in terms of religion and political ideology, them two things are, are separate and should always uh, remain separate. I'm from Northern Ireland, where there has been a conflict, there's been an Irish conflict for hundreds and hundreds of years. The aggressor being uh, Britain, um, and a lot of people in Britain still think that Catholics and Protestants who live in Northern Ireland disagree because of religion and religion only. That is not the case. Catholics happen to be from an Irish nationalist uh, perspective and Protestants tend to be from the British Unionist perspective. It happens to be that Catholics, the original Irish people, want Ireland to reunite. The uh, Protestants are from Britain and they wish Northern Ireland to remain part of the UK. So I can see the parallels there. Um, you know, we had a conflict of our own and it wasn't about Protestant and Catholic because they're very similar. They're under the same umbrella of, of Christianity. So it's not really like, oh, we, we disagree with you because we believe in the Virgin Mary and you don't. You know, it, it doesn't come down to religion. It co comes down to political ideology. And yes, there will be some people out there who do fight. Palestine, for example, are they doing it because of religion? Because they, 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 because they don't believe in the Jewish religion? No, they're doing it because they've been bombed uh, in Syria. For, oh, sorry, in, in, uh, in the Gaza Strip for 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 years and they're trying to defend their land they're trying to claim what is theirs it's a political ideology it's not religious and i think this video um 
brings that to light. Very good speaker, that guy, I must say. Um, he knows his stuff, very intelligent and very right, you know, what he's saying, most definitely. Uh, so I think, again, a lot of people uh, from this part of the world should watch videos like that and open their mind. Not all Muslims, uh, in fact, the vast, vast majority of them are not violent and do not want to be violent. Yeah. So, lot to take in there. Um, is Islam a peaceful religion? Well, I think it's very true. Well, many, uh, many of the points made there, you know, it's, I mean, most religions, you, you can uh, look at them, you can interpret them in a way that they come from a good place, they come from a place of love, you know, but there is a difference as well between the scripture, the intention of the scripture, the interpretation of the scripture, and the reality on the ground. And the reality on the ground in, in many places is that religions, including Islam, are you know, Mehdi mentioned there that, um, you know, a lot of people, it is a source of their identity, a source of uh, solace, a source of confidence, you know. And a lot of religions are empowering, they are facilitating these people who are extremists to go forward and commit uh, their acts with what they believe is the blessing of this religion. And that's true for extremists from any religion or cult or particular belief system, really. You know, the question here really is looking at uh, these politically motivated, true uh, extremists, would they be more or less likely to go ahead with the acts they commit if they were Muslim or belonged to a different religion or were atheists or just, you know, were agnostic or any other denomination. Um, you know, does Islam actively promote peace compared with, for example, a non-believer, you know, um, I know that the infrastructure of religion, be that Muslim or of another uh, uh, group of uh, believers, for example, uh, churches or mosques or temples or whatever, these serve as nexuses, as meeting grounds, as training grounds, people meet and share ideas. And if those ideas are good, that can be a force for good. And if those ideas are bad, then it can be a source of bad. The fact that it is an organized religion, that religion is organized, it enhances and it spreads the ideas that are present in a community already. We see this in Christianity. There are a lot of very horrible Christian communities in the UK, in the US. You know, we see this in these mad like uh anti-abortion uh christians and like god hates gays god hates fags you know like this is fundamentally uh it is nurtured and it is facilitated by the organization of the religion and unfortunately the same thing happens with islam you know you have people with horrible ideas they're able to come together at not every mosque but you know their local society or mosque or whatever nexus there is in that community that has that toxic problem and unfortunately i think that gives them a, a platform it gives them a place to talk about it and to you know but this is not exclusive to islam however the debate here is is islam a peaceful religion i think all religions have the power to be a force for good or a force for bad and unfortunately i think most of them these days are doing more harm than good. But that is a political thing and that is, stems from the inherent feeling in these communities. Alhamdulillah.